Yeah, thanks, Pada. Uh, yeah, yeah, hi, everyone. So thanks for coming for uh, the third time. Um, I'll try to make it work. Right? So uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, where we are and what's going to happen today. So I realize now that I look at this that I packed a little bit too much. But um, uh, so if you remember from uh, the end of the first lecture, uh, the goal uh, was to compute, uh, to, to design, to show the existence of a computable function. Uh, this function maps Turing machines uh, to triples of integers n, k, and the game. Um, if you remember, this game used to be a linear function, um, but then uh, last time uh, we saw that we we're going to construct these linear functionals just, just as non-local games. n and k are uh, parameters that, uh, that represent the number of questions and the number of answers. In there. I want this to be a reduction um, from the hunting problem to the problem of deciding if uh, basically, this game has a strategy that succeeds with probability one, a quantum strategy that succeeds with probability one. So the train machine halts, a omega star of the game should be one, and if it doesn't halt, omega star should be less than half. Uh, omega star of the game, if you remember, this was the supremum for all uh, families of distributions uh, that lie in the set Q star uh, of the success probability in the game that this distribution gives rise to. So I, I didn't put those definitions back on the board because they're, they're less important for today. Um, to just remind you what's a non-local game, it's given by a set of questions X, a set of answers A, these are finite sets. Um, then there's a distribution pi, which is a distribution on questions. So it's a distribution on the Cartesian product of X with itself. And then there's a decision function D that goes from X cross X cross A cross A to uh, zero one. And this just tells you if a pair of answers is valid for, for a given pair of questions. The details of this also are not gonna be uh, less important, not gonna be so important today. Um, so um, th this was our main goal. So we, show in, we saw in the first lecture that uh, showing this directly uh, refutes constant bedding problem or this problem. Um, but then in the last lecture, I started moving towards a proxy, which is the thing that we're gonna focus on uh, today. So I, I won't directly show you the reduction. Instead, what we'll be concerned with is constructing games uh, such that these games remain uh, simple. Uh, so here, my, my measure of simplicity is simply the, the size that I measure as just the, the log of the number of questions plus the log of the number of answers is just arbitrary. So it's, it's, it's a proxy for size. Um, but uh, these games can be used to witness a very high degree of complexity. Okay, and what I mean by that, if I make it a bit precise, it means that any strategy that succeeds in the game with probability larger uh, than half, then this strategy must uh, lie in a very large dimension. So remember to every strategy, we can associate a, a dimension parameter which is the dimension of the Hilbert space on which uh, the, 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 the measurements uh, associated with the strategy lie. And I want this to be large. Okay, I want to keep the game, game small, um, but I want winning in that game to become increasingly hard. Eventually, we'd have to do something a little bit more elaborate. We'd have to start with a Turing machine, somehow construct a game from that Turing machine, iterate this procedure. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't told you what the procedure was. So, um, okay, so the way we're going to do that is by uh, starting with games that are uh, large um, and, and reducing the size of those games while maintaining um, uh, this, this here. So this is also something that I said last time. I said the main uh, the building block is a procedure compressed. So that's a computable function from games to uh, games such that uh, it has the effect of reducing substantially the size of the game. So this substantially is a uh, logarithm or polylogarithm, um, and it preserves important characteristics of the game. So if the game had a perfect winning strategy uh, G, then, then this is also the case for G prime. And furthermore, um, uh, G prime is, is hard to win. So if there is a strategy in G prime that succeeds not even with already one, but something bigger than half, then, um, dimension of that strategy should be large and large as a function of the size of the game G. So I think what I wrote last time was two to the um, size of the game. Okay. So if you start with a very large game, uh, that's kind of trivial. It's possible to succeed in this game just by, you know, you always win in the game, let's say. Uh, but you iterate this procedure many times, the size of the game will reduce, but it will become harder and harder to succeed uh, in the game, okay? So by iterating this a finite number of times, you achieve something like uh, this proxy. Uh, to achieve the goal, we need a bit more. Uh, we need to embed Turing machines into uh, games. We need to iterate this procedure, uh, in fact, an infinite number of times, or, or rather 
set it up so that it has a fixed point, and this fixed point will be the game that's associated to the Turing machine. There. Um, but that, that part I completely uh, skipped because I just don't have time to go into this detail. Okay. Uh, so last time we decomposed this procedure into three parts, and today I'm going to focus on uh, the part that's the most uh, novel uh, to, to, to the work, um, which is called introspection. Uh, so let's, let's write what introspection does here. Introspection. This is one of three parts of this complex procedure. So it's again, it's a computable map from games G to games G prime, such that um, when it has the effect of reducing not the total size, uh, but only the, the number of questions. So N prime, which is the question set of the game, size of the question set of the game G prime, this will be much smaller than N, but K prime, the number of answers, this will be uh, not, you know, not smaller. So in fact, it'll be slightly uh, a bit bigger than what it was uh, before. Uh, so we want to reduce the size in that way and uh, also have uh, the two guarantees that are, that are written here that I'm not copying over the, uh, over the board. Okay, then there were two other steps that had the effect of reducing the number of answers and then also a step of sort of necessary amplification step that I, I don't want to go back to. Um, any questions on the setup? I'm going to, the goal for today is to try to give you some of the ideas that go into realizing that, uh, that procedure. And the way I'll do that is that uh, I'll connect it to a notion of uh, efficient stability, which is a purely group theoretic notion that, uh, that I'll define and I'll talk a little bit. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more. So in, in principle, this introspection is actually bad, right? So you're getting something larger when you sum the two. Uh, that's I, it, it's I, possible I mean, that you would get something larger if yeah. you just sum the two. But the sum of the two is coarse grained, and if you yeah, 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 find sure. the I mean, you know, and then another step which yeah. reduces the number of answers. Yeah, but I mean, it's still kind of uh, fun, fun. But, you know. So, um, what's the idea for this? So, first, I'll state the idea in like games, playful language, and then I'll be a bit more precise mathematically. Uh, so the idea in the language of games is that you start from a game, and this game has certain rules that are given to you. So you're supposed to generate questions, send questions to the players, then they generate answers and send them back. What you're going to try to do is, uh, instead of generating the questions and sending them to the players, and this is why it's called introspection, you're going to ask them to generate their own questions. So this is much more efficient uh, to, 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 to ask. Instead of sending a potentially very long question, you just send them uh, you know, a very short message that says, well, why don't you just select your own question? and then determine the answer to that question, uh, and then report to me both the question and the answer. Okay. So they report both the question and the answer, this explains this, uh, this K prime. And the way I formulated it, this is even, you know, just like two or something like this. I mean, I'm just, I'm always saying the same thing. So it's, there's just one, one or two questions. Um, of course, there's a problem. If I let the players generate uh, their own questions, they generate uh, an easy question, and then they always succeed again. So the difficulty is that we want to set up the game G prime so that in the game G prime, there's going to be a special question. This special question is going to be, please generate your question as in G and give me the answer. Um, but we want the other questions around that question, which, which, which is going to use uh, that, that, that number of questions uh, to force the player to generate this question according to the distribution that it's supposed to generate questions from in, in G. For the computer scientists in the audience, I'm not sure how many computer scientists there are, but this is something extremely special. Uh, this is where you need uh, quantum computation, you need entanglement uh, in order to be able to, to do that. Uh, the reason is that you want to control the distribution that's used by the players to generate their answers. Uh, and in general, in complexity theory, uh, we have delegated computation procedures, but it's very hard to control the randomness of someone else. Uh, you can't do that. You have to inject the randomness yourself and then make them. Make them use it. Here we're going to use a the entanglement between the players basically in order to force them to generate randomness in the way that we control. Uh, that's, that's what's really special. Uh, okay. well, this, this was kind of a high level message. Um, so the semantics of what we're going to do, but I'll, let, me, let me be more precise now. Uh, so to be more precise, I need to introduce a, a group that we're going to be working uh, with through the lecture. It's, uh, it's called the Pauli group uh, in quantum information. Uh, in math, it has many other names, such as uh, it's, it's, a, it's a version of Heisenberg groups over a finite field with, with two elements. Our language is very concrete. So let me tell you um, what the poly group of order K is, um, or parameter K. So if you remember the poly matrices from last time, so I introduced two of them, sigma X and sigma Z. Okay, so what's special about, what's important about these is that they square, they're symmetric, they square to identity, 
uh, in the two of them are different. Um, now I can generate uh, bigger matrices by taking tensor products of these. So I'll, this is notation. I'll write sigma x of A to be sigma x A1 tensor tensor sigma x AK, where A is, um, is a k-bit string. Okay, so this is a two to the k by two to the k uh, matrix, and there is two to the k of them. Uh, I can also similarly define sigma z of b to be sigma z b1 a of b. Okay. Okay. And the poly group uh, pk, uh, which is parameterized by this integer k, is just going to be the group generated by these matrices. So sigma x of a. Sigma Z B. Um, it has size twice two is for a sign and uh, two to the k squared um, for, for these. So when k is one, it has size eight. Uh, and the eight elements, they're the identity, sigma x, sigma z, the product of sigma x, sigma z, and the opposite of everything that I said. There is some confusion. Uh, also, I don't know, for people who do group theory, you can see this as a you can say it's a central extension of the product of two copies of uh, z2 uh, to the k okay so it's uh, it's basically two copies of z2 to the k um and then it has a little bit of a, uh, the anti-commutation like a strange multiplication rule between these different elements um all right it, there's one more piece of notation uh, that i that i that i need i define this to x um, okay. Okay, this expectation is a uniform expectation over all uh, k uh, bit uh, strings u, and this is inner product um, with the two. Um, so this is uh, just it's kind of a Fourier transform. Uh, you don't really need to parse the definition if, if you don't want to. Um, what uh, you can observe is that these are rank one projections. Uh, so tau, for example, tau zb is rank one, if you did the calculation, you'd observe this rank one projection on what the vector EB1 tensor tensor EBK. So this is, uh, here I have, uh, uh, so I'll write it, so in C2 tensor, <coughs> tensor C2. So I can take a basis E0, E1 uh, of C2, and then this is the vector E, you know, E1, E0, or E1. <laughs> Uh, in, in particular, this is in the in the in the sense from last time um, when I fix let's say z and I go over all d. This is a projective measurement in the sense that uh, it's a bunch of projections, orthogonal projections that sum to identity when I sum over all d's. Okay, because when I sum over all d's, I get a basis. Uh, here. Okay. This one is in some sense the Fourier transform of that one. Uh, let me not write the formula. Is this okay? In the notation questions. Okay, so now let me state uh, a theorem. That's the theorem that's uh, like a bit more precise that achieves the introspection step. And then we won't even prove that theorem. After that, I'll go into even more specific things. Um, but 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 let me state the game that uh, 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 that we're going to construct. So for every integer that is uh, capital N, there exists some game uh, H capital N. Uh, that, that, that has the following properties. So such that the, uh, the size, so in terms of if I measure the size of the question set, then um, this is roughly log n, the size of the answers is uh, n. Okay, so that's the size of the sets, then the set xn has two distinguished questions in it. So there exists two special symbols, and I apologize for overloading the notation, but I somehow couldn't avoid that. So that's two special symbols, X and Z, in maybe I can put them in this way. X and Z in XN. These symbols have um, 
a large weight under the game distribution. Okay, so this game has a certain distribution on questions, which I'm not going to make explicit. Um, the distribution on questions is distribution on pairs of questions, um, but I can look at the marginal and the weight that the marginal puts on X and Z is uh, so quarter. Um, so a quarter, what's important about a quarter is that it's uh, it's large. Um, and then just uh, last last statement. So if the strategy succeeds in this game, H the probability one, and I'll argue a little bit about this later, it implies that this strategy has a very specific structure. Um, so let me say the important parts about the structure. First of all, its dimension must be very large. So the dimension of the strategy must be equal to two to the n. So it must be a multiple of two to the n times d prime. d prime is an integer, it cannot be zero. Uh, and there exists a unitary w on CD such that, um, I'm almost done, and then we'll talk about this for a little while, okay? So I hope you can follow the, the notation. So this game had two special questions. They're called X and Z, they're two fixed questions. Um, so when a strategy plays the game, it needs to have uh, measurement operators associated with these questions. And I'm gonna say what these measurement operators look like. Uh, they must look like the following. So the notation for the measurement operator associated to question X, this was PX. The number of answers is, uh, the length of the answer is, uh, is N. And ah, this is a capital N for you. Uh, I mean, HN is something that hasn't worked before. Uh, no, sorry. Um, I mean, sorry, just a sec. It's going to be bigger than the power equals, right? <laughs> Say that again. Is HN somehow coming from a Heisenberg group? Um, yeah, so, 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 so this is just a game, um, but the way we designed the game is, um, yes, based on some things that I'll say afterwards that are related. More than just Pauli, right? It must, I mean, these Pauli matrices generate, they don't generate all unitaries. No, no, they generate a finite group. Yeah, so you have to go further. Right? Uh, no, why? I don't know, it's just uh, from... Uh, universal gates construction. Uh, we don't, we don't, uh, so this is actually not, not needed. So I'm not you know, claiming that again. But it doesn't reflect itself somewhere? Um, uh, no, so I, we can talk about this after, um, but depending exactly how you think about uh, computations, and if you think about not necessarily executing the computation, but verifying the computation, you can verify computations using a more limited set of gates than is needed to execute computations. That's a little bit what's going on there, but I, I don't want to go there. So I'll right we, we, we tell you more after. So we don't need a universal set of gates. The, this group is going to be enough for our purposes in terms of computer okay. power. So it's a bit boring. Um, um, all, all right, so I finished the, this. Uh, the mu is pi? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. The mu is pi. <laughs> it's the marginal of pi. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, we thought that the question should be a projection of some rate. Um, okay, so the notation is that uh, for every question in the game, such so that uh, X, for example, X is a, it's just the label of the question. Uh, the strategy has uh, a projective uh, uh, measurement. So it's a collection of projectors uh, that's indexed by the answers to that question. Um, so here my answers, I'm identifying them with uh, capital N bit strings. Um, and so as part of any strategy in this game, just the way it's defined, um, there's many different measurements for the many different questions, but for these two distinguished questions, there's two different measurements. There's PXA, so these are orthogonal projections on, in general, some, some CD for any D uh, that sum, when I sum them over A, I get the identity. And, and similarly for Z, so in general, whenever I design a game that has two special questions called X and Z, and the answers to these questions uh, have length N, then the strategy for the game uh, is necessarily going to involve uh, two families of projections, these and these, uh, that are orthogonal and some to identity. What's special about this game is that in order to succeed in the game with probability one I wrote here, 
um, you cannot use any uh, projections there. Um, in fact, the projections that you use must be unitarily equivalent to uh, the ones that are written on, on the board here. So, so to spectral projections associated with the poly matrices. In particular, these all have the same uh, rank, okay? This has rank one, this identity is on D prime. So this has a certain rank, like a corollary of, uh, of what's written, it's not the important part, but is that each of these have the same rank. Okay, that's not part of the requirements, just the definition of the strategy. Uh, but moreover, they're very special, what's, uh, and these are these, and, and, and these are those. Are those. Um, so I want to, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to prove this directly. After this, I move to some more concrete things uh, about groups. Um, but in, in um, I, I hope that you can parse the statement, and uh, I want to help you parse it um, by showing why it implies that we can achieve uh, introspection, which was the goal for for today's lecture. So there's so there's a few remarks uh, that I want to make. By intuition, why the fixed points are computable because it's what you want, right? To... Ah, yeah, no, no. So I put that completely aside uh, for. So I think maybe you you missed the first sentence of the lecture or something, but. Uh, um, uh, we can talk about this after. So I put I put I put fixed points and computability aside. I'm not I'm not I'm not focusing on, on that for now. Brilliant. And maybe you want to rephrase your question. I don't know if it's directly about this, but here there's nothing about. Uh, I mean, this game is computable uh, if you want. But uh, there's no fixed points here. This is. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so so here's one important observation, which is which is the reason that I'm using the polys and why why it's important that uh, I get these specific uh, projections here. Uh, so this is the, the first remark. Uh, the first remark is that suppose that uh, in the game now we ask the question pair uh, x comma x. Okay, so if uh, the question is x comma x, and I want to look at what's the distribution on answers that's provided by any successful strategy in this game. So the distribution on answers, if you remember the formula, so P of A, B given, so here it's just X, X, this is equal to one over D times the matrix trace of P, X, uh, A times P, X, uh, B. Okay, that's just by definition of how we associate probably these two strategies. Um, now, if A is different from B because these are orthogonal, I'm going to get zero. Um, and because we observed that all these operators have the same rank, I'm really going to get one over two to the n times the, the chronicle of, of, of A and B. Okay. So if the strategy has this structure, it means that when you ask the same question and x, x and x to both players, they must return the same answer A, A equals B. And moreover, whatever what answer they choose, it must just be uniformly distributed over. Uh, another one that we can observe is that if the question pair is x and z, then do the calculation for these two. Let's say in here is going to be PCB. And I didn't do all the calculation, so I have to tell you what the result is, but it's it's not hard to verify that here I get one over two to the um, two n. Um, which means that if these are the two questions, then the answers are uniform and uncorrelated. Okay, P and B, both of them are uniformly distributed and they're not, they don't need to be the same. Here they're uniformly distributed, but they need to be the same. Okay. So this is the sense in which the game allows me to gain control over the distribution uh, that these players are generating uh, answers with, okay? There's many questions in the game, but there's some special ones. And on the special ones, they must return answers that are in this case, uniformly distributed and identical, in this case, uniformly distributed um, and uncorrelated. So how are we going to use this game in order to achieve uh, introspection? So in introspection, remember that we started from we start from some arbitrary game G, and we want to construct a smaller game G prime that has fewer questions. Uh, so let's so this is G, um, and let's let's assume for simplicity that uh, G is such that the question set in G is uh, n bit strings, uh, and let's also suppose that the distribution on questions uh, pi in G is uniform. Okay, so uh, the questions are uniformly random. Small x is uniformly random in this set. Small y is also uniformly random in this set. That's, that's an example. How am I going to, to simulate G using a much smaller game G prime? Um, the way we'll do that is that we simply run H capital N uh, for that N. 
H capital N is much smaller than G, right? The, the size of the question set is log N. Here, the size of the question set is N. So we have received coarser reduction. Uh, the only modification that we make to HN is that whenever the pair of questions is X and X, uh, we ask the player to report not only A and B, or you know, A and A, as we know it must be the case, but also they're supposed to interpret the A as a question in G and give the answer that it would have given in G. Okay? So we tell them, if your questions were X and X, generate an answer as in HN, but also think of that answer as in question in G and give me the answer you would have given. Okay. And then we check these answers as in. This is a single question? Like they- In that case, because I started from- a, Sorry? But then they, they'll get the same question. Like maybe you want two N, right? Um, no, they get the question capital X. Capital X is a bit overloaded, but this is the question pair they'll get. And each of them will generate, uh, oh, X and Z. Sorry, it should be X and Z because, I'm um, sorry, it's uniform. Yeah, X and Z. So I use X and Z, but it's a single question pair. Ah, and then they'll get the uniform. They'll get a uniform. The first player will get a uniform A. By this equation, the first player will get a uniform A and the second uniform B. Yeah. It must be the case that's the only way they'll be able to succeed in the rules of H. Um, and then they interpret these uniformly randomly. They don't know if they get X and Z, they might get X and X. Anyway, you have to do the second part of right. extending to run that. Right, right. right. So that's, I guess that's important to know this. Of course, they don't know um, if I'm just executing the game HN and checking whatever checks the game HN has, which, which I didn't specify for you, right? I didn't specify the decision function for HN, it's some function. <laughs> um, uh, and at some of the time, uh, right, so yeah. In, of course, not every game has uh, this set for questions and this distribution. The set for questions, I mean, that's a mild requirement because whatever finite set it is, you can always embed it. This, so that's not a problem. Uh, the difficulty is that the distribution of questions in the game G could be complex. It could be uniform um, or, uh, you know, if it was uniform uncorrelated, we know how to do it. Uniform correlated, we know how to do it. What about all the other cases? Um, Okay, so a lot of work in the proof has to do with massaging uh, these games and making sure um, that the games that you need to treat in the analysis only have question distributions that you're able to simulate or enforce uh, using, using this, this statement. Okay. And that's something I'm just going to ask. These are just examples of two possible distributions. There. Okay, so this was a, a remark on how the, the thing is used. By the way, um, there was a uh, a requirement on the dimension of the strategies that succeed, uh, and, and this requirement is met here. So the dimension of any successful strategy is at least to the end as we wanted. So we got that also. Um, one thing that we didn't get is that here I'm only talking about success probability one, and in fact I want the conclusions to apply in some relaxed form, uh, even if the success probability is bigger than half. Um, so approximate versions of the statements that are written here hold. Um, I just didn't formulate them because it becomes a little bit more tricky to um, uh, write. Okay. So <clears throat> we'd have to do that. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna uh, switch gears uh, and to have a self-contained treatment of uh, stability in, uh, in, in, in groups. And uh, at, at some point, I'll make the connection with what we did uh, here. Uh, but, in, but in case I lost you, it's a, it's a good place to, uh, to come to, to jump back in. Um, uh, although if there are some questions about the statement here and uh, how the statement is used for introspection or what it implies. So, so, so you will leave this now is a good time for us. We turn to HN and the Heisenberg group through stability. So. I'm gonna, um, eventually we're gonna construct HN uh, we're going to reduce the construction of HN to a specific statement, specific stability statement about the Heisenberg group. Yeah. So I'll say what the stability statement is at the end of the lecture. I won't do the reduction, uh, but it's the reduction is easy. I don't want you to leave without the Heisenberg group. Uh, well, I mean, okay, for me, I, I don't know. There's many Heisenberg groups. I, what I mean is we need a poly group over there. So uh, if, if we agree that that's the group we're talking about. Uh, I think for what I understand, a Heisenberg group can be defined over any kinds of fields and uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so okay. Uh, okay, other questions? Okay, good. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll erase this.
Okay, so now we're going to go into some more, uh, much, much more uh, specific things. But in the end, uh, is, is really the technical heart of the, of the entire construction and is, is what's, what's, what's coming now. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll, I'll say first some general definitions and then we we'll specialize them to the group that we care about. So um, I'm going to be talking about finitely presented groups. In fact, I'm going to be talking about finite groups, but uh, um, another word I say applies to finitely presented groups. So a finitely presented group is uh, just something that's given like this, where S is uh, a set of uh, generators and R is a set of relations. So for example, uh, I could write a presentation of Z2. Uh, so this is Z cross Z uh, as B having two generators A and B. And then the only relation between these two generators is that the, the, the group commutator uh, is, uh, is vanishes. Okay, so this is A, B, A inverse. Uh, uh, B inverse. So that, that's an example of a group presentation. Uh, okay, so definition. I want to define a notion of an epsilon homomorphism. So we know what homomorphisms are from a group to um, unitaries. Uh, here I'll define epsilon homomorphism. So this is going to be some approximate notion of being a homomorphism. So not epsilon homomorphism from G to unitaries in some dimension D. The definitions I give, they can be extended to things that map into um, general. Uh, Sister algebra is like infinite dimensional spaces, but uh, we only need finite dimensional motions uh, uh, here. Such that, so this is the function, okay? So it doesn't it doesn't respect any so far. Uh, I, but I'm going to require that it approximately respects uh, the relations that are used to present the group in the following sense. So such that if I take the average uh, over all relations, a finite number of relations, some the relations of So there's a couple of pieces of notation here. So the norm that I'll use is um, well, the, the dimension normalized in this norm. So it's a norm that's compatible with everything we've been doing so far. Okay, so it's just a Frobenius norm, the sum of the squares of the entries, but I normalize by the dimension. So D uh, is the dimension of, of, of X here always. That's phi of R. Uh, so phi is defined on, uh, uh, in fact, I'm sorry. I only need the, the map to be defined on the generators. So phi is defined on the generators. Uh, how do I define phi of a relation? Well, this relation is just a product of the generators. And so it's, I just define it as the product phi of R1, phi of R2, phi of Rt, where T is the length. So this is a pretty weak notion of uh, approximate homomorphism uh, because I only require the map to be defined on the generators. Um, I only require it to approximately respect the relations that are given in the presentation. So it's a notion that depends on the specific presentation. If I take different presentations of the same group, I get a different notion. This will actually be important later on. Uh, it needs to respect uh, the relations in the Frobenius norm. And this is a little bit arbitrary, but I fixed the distribution on relations. In fact, I chose the uniform distribution on the relations. and. I'm just asking this to be satisfied on average. So if there's many relations, it's quite possible that there's one of them that's not even satisfied at all, right? Because this is an average. So for some specific relations, this could be equal to two. Okay. But anyways, that's the definition. Any questions on the definition? You translate it to something which is independent of like something that's more normal, like phi of g, one g2 minus phi of g1. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll get to we'll get to that in a second, actually, you know, or maybe in, 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 in a couple of minutes. Um, first, let's uh, let me just give a, a notion of stability, um, and then and then we'll talk a little bit more. Okay, so before I define stability, I need a notion of uh, closeness uh, between different. Uh, epsilon uh, homomorphisms or dif different maps in general. So if I take two maps from the generators, so the first one maps the generators to unitaries in D dimensions. The second one maps the generators to unitaries and maybe some other uh, number of dimensions. So only for us that we can compare uh, homomorphisms or approximate morphisms that map to different uh, dimensions. So I'd say that these are delta close because there is some, some parameter. 
uh, if there exists a isometry that goes from CD to CD uh, prime. So for this to hold, D prime should be uh, larger than V, um, such that Here, when I look on the average over a generator, uh, these maps tend to map to up to the, the correction by the isometry. They tend to map generators to unitaries that are close, uh, you know, up to a rotation that doesn't depend on, on anything. I mean, it doesn't depend on, on S here. This is a uniform average again. So, sorry, I should, I could, I could write it. So. <clears throat> Okay. Well, that's the what did I do? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. All right. And so using this notion, I can define what it means for a group to be stable. So G, in fact, it's it's not really the group, it's the presentation of the group. Right. I was saying like it depends, it depends on the yeah, yeah. So we'll see some examples, hopefully. Um is stable uh, if any epsilon homomorphism is delta close. So this delta now is going to be a function of epsilon. So it's delta of epsilon close to a homomorphism. So homomorphism uh, is going to be defined on the whole group. Uh, okay. That's the notion of homomorphism. I exactly respect uh, the multiplication table of the group. Uh, but I'll say that my epsilon homomorphism, the group is stable if whenever I have an epsilon homomorphism, which is something only defined on the generators that approximately respects the relations, this should be delta of epsilon close. Ideally, this delta is a function that we go to zero if epsilon goes to zero, obviously, uh, to an actual homomorphism. The homomorphism is defined on the whole group. Epsilon homomorphism is only defined on the generators, and I measure their distance. That's my notion of closeness here, on, only on the generators. <laughs> so delta has to go to be zero, or you don't need? Um, well, I mean, I know I'm giving the definition in general, but uh, yeah. Uh, sure, I mean, for it to be meaningful, it should go to zero. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, maybe some comments, like do, th there's many notions of stability for, for groups in, in, in the literature. Um, what are some important differences uh, in, with this notion? This notion, as it said, doesn't really appear so much. I mean, actually, if someone has, uh, it does appear, um, sorry, I forgot the reference, but it, it does appear, um, I forgot the reference. Um, oftentimes, the norm that's considered is the operator norm, uh, and that makes a very big difference. So the notion is very dependent on the, on the type of norm. Um, oftentimes, uh, the notion of an epsilon homomorphism would be a map that's defined on the whole group, and it should approximately respect the multiplication table of the group. We're going to make the connection with that in just a sec. Um, so here I have a weakening that have, because of these averages, the average appears both in the assumptions of what's an epsilon homomorphism and the conclusions of what's, what's, what's uh, being close to. That's the second remark. And the third remark is uh, the fact that uh, in the notion of closeness, we allow the dimension uh, of the range of these homomorphisms to, to range. So that's, that's often referred to as, uh, as flexible uh, stability. Uh, sometimes you could be stricter and require that D prime equal to D, and, uh, and I'm not going to do that. All right, so, uh, um, so let me make the connection with uh, what, what uh, so here's question. Um, just the bot skill always points out three notions. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to understand which one. You know, the one's related to sophic, one is related to. Oh, this is the hyperlinear. I, I so this one is related to hyperlinear. Yeah. Uh, for sophicity, you just uh, consider per permutation. Um, so here's a theorem that's. Uh, that's 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 like one of the important theorems in uh, in, in in the study of this, this particular notion of uh, stability is due to Gowers and, and Hatami. We've got Tim Gowers and Hatami is a, is a student of his. Um, it applies to finite groups. So if I take G to be a finite group, then I can always give like a kind of like a wasteful representation uh, presentation. Sorry, of the group. So I can always try and write G as I can take as generators. All elements of the group, and as relations, the multiplication table. So I would say that G times H times 
gh inverse should be equal to e for every g and h in, in, in the group. Okay, so I think of this as the label of a group element. This is a label, and again, this whole thing is a label, but it's a little less associated. Okay, so that's a valid uh, presentation for the group, and their result is that uh, uh, g finite g's presentation. So this is is delta of epsilon equals to just a constant, universal constant times epsilon. Uh, stability. So we have kind of like a, a universal uh, stability result for all finite groups with a very good uh, modulus uh, uh, here delta, uh, but it requires uh, the presentation to be, to involve all the, all the So the question in uh, like efficient stability is whether for any particular group of interest, uh, including finite groups, um, we can obtain a presentation for the group that remains stable with, you know, ideally uh, this kind of modulus, but is much more uh, compact. Um, so the number of generators could be much smaller and the number of relations could also be much smaller. Let me give you an example. Um, okay, I, it's okay if I erase the, 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 the notion, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Is this stability, is it monotone somehow? You're saying if you have a shorter presentation, it's supposed to be harder to be stable? Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, let me answer that in, 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 a, in, a, in a second. Okay. Um, not, uh, there's no, and I partially answer it in a second. I mean, it's not necessarily harder, but it's, it's uh, uh, it can't be easier. I think it can be it's even harder when you get the larger, for for the free group, if you like, you can like artificially add generators and relations to just make things harder, right? But well, it'd be harder to be a homomorphism, but uh, it won't be harder to be stable once you have a homomorphism. No, I think the parameter, the delta, will be will be worse for this present. Oh, okay, because right, you're right. Delta, you're right. It's a bit it's a bit delicate because also the fact that these things are measured on uniformly, and so if you make the number of of, of relations very large. But there's only a couple that matter to you, then they get very small weight in this, in this average. So you, you can indeed do like kind of like three. Okay, so let, let me give you an example. So even before we get to the group there, let's just group even, even simpler groups. So Z2 to the K. Uh, I'm going to give two presentations of it. So the first one is the one from the theorem. So the one from the theorem would be I would just use as labels, uh, maybe I just, I just write it like this. To, Distinguish it from the from the group, and then as relations, I would put that a times b times, uh, you know, and here let's say a plus b mod two. Okay, so this is the the presentation for z two uh, to the k that we get at the theorem, and this presentation is still. I can give a, a shorter presentation uh, that would have only. K, so there's K elements uh, here instead of two to the K here. And I'm just gonna require that uh, these elements are idempotent, idempotent, and uh, they should commute. Okay, so this presentation is much more efficient because it has logarithmically many generators um, and also logarithmically many or, or square logarithmically many uh, relations as it had before. So it's much shorter. Unfortunately, uh, so this one is okay, so in fact, you can show that the dependence on epsilon of the this modulus of stability for that much shorter presentation is the same, but you have a prefactor that is very large. It depends on the size of the group. And that's something that in our context, let me not explain why, but we absolutely want to uh, Avoid. Uh, okay. So here it's pretty intuitive. Why do you pay this price? Um, uh, here's a way you would prove the theorem. You would say, okay, well, fine. Let's take an approximate homomorphism from this presentation. So it's something that's only defined on the K generators here. I can define an approximate homomorphism of this presentation just by defining phi of A to be the product of the phi of X's such that you know A has a one in that position. Um, but then uh, if I do that and I check uh, the relations on that extended phi, then I'll see that 
just by using that these relations are satisfied up to epsilon here, they'll be satisfied up to two to the k epsilon. And so I'll be able to apply this theorem, but with two to the k uh, epsilon. Okay. So there's a very intuitive uh, trade-off at that level. This was kind of like my answer to your question, but I don't know if it, uh, if, if it helps, which is that uh, if, you, if you use fewer generators, then any, you know, as long as it's a presentation of the group, any home, approximate homomorphism, you can always extend it to this just by taking products of the image of your map on these things. But then the extent by which you satisfy the relations will depend on the length of the products that you've had to make. And typically this will depend on, on the size of the group, you know, or, or log of the size of the group to the base of this, you know, something like that. So, all right. So, So in the interest of time, uh, sorry, Peter, I'm going to focus just on Z2 to the K. Um, I, won't, I won't even go to, uh, to the poly group, but, uh, but because this group is just basically some, some, some extension of the product of two copies of Z2 to the K, the things that I say will, will also apply to that group. So I just, um, I, I don't have time to- have a non-abelian feature. Yeah, so, so there is a non-abelian feature that's not present here. And potentially it could be important. Um, and, but uh, but but that actually it is, is important or not? It, um, yeah, yeah, it is important. I mean, um, uh, in, in particular, if you think about uh, homomorphisms or representations, so representations of Z to the K are one-dimensional irreducible. But here, there's one irreducible representation that is dimension two to the N, and this is very important to get the dimension bounds on that. So it's definitely important. I couldn't live only. Okay, so that would really be too boring. Um, uh, uh, okay, so I'll state what uh, the, the key, the key, the key result is. Uh, okay, so the key, uh, the key result is the following. So for every k, there exists a presentation of z two to the k. So this presentation is written as s k uh, r k uh, that has the following properties. So the parameters are a bit ugly, but we'll uh, I'm going to give it a real thing and then talk about it. So the number of generators. Maybe let's just stare at that for a second because I'm taking logs on both sides. It means that the number of generators is exponential in a polynomial. Let's say this polynomial is just a square. Okay, so it's two to the square of log k. So it's something that's much smaller than two to the k that we had above there, but it's also much bigger than k, which we have in this. It's intermediate. I think of it as quasi polynomial, so it's closer to the bottom one. But you can argue about something is weird. Okay, log of k. Uh, poly k in the sense that you just mentioned. No, there's a log also here. Huh? Uh, okay, sorry. I didn't want to write yeah. this mention, but yeah. Uh, the same for this, and the case of that, and uh, the stability is. I would like to write that it's uh, O of epsilon stable, but unfortunately, it's not. Um, but it's not. It's a this polynomial of. K times the number of epsilon is it that right to the epsilon I C for some so you can think of it as an intermediate result between the two uh, that are over there where the number of relations uh, 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 and generators is a bit bigger than just linear in K. Um, uh, but it's sub-exponential. And the modulus of stability is also a little bit intermediate. So it has some dependence on epsilon, which is something like a square root or a fourth power. Um, and it has a prefactor, which is polynomial in the size of the group. So I want to try to convince you uh, in words um, that this is a non-trivial statement. So it's the only statement of its kind that I know. And take her for a uh, similar statement. So, so in what sense do I mean that? So I've been kind of saying that the parameters are intermediate between the two that are there. Uh, but in fact, I, I want to claim that they're much stronger. Uh, so to show that, to see that, suppose that we started with an epsilon homomorphism of this presentation, and we tried to show that it's delta close to an actual homomorphism by applying the proof strategy that I described earlier, meaning we take it on the generator, then we extend it to the entire group, and we apply the theorem that's over there. And then what, what would that cost us? So here, the number of uh, uh, the, the number of generators is two to the polylog k. 
the number of group elements is two to the k. Okay, so if I have two to the point of k elements, and I want to reach all possible two to the k elements, how many will I have to take the product? I have to take the product of roughly uh, a log over log log. Yeah, so um, sorry, these are numbers of group of elements. Uh, yeah, so I'll have to take sequences of length, uh, no, roughly k, no? So like k, k by log or something like that. Yeah, log is oh, the group is k over log k. Yeah, k over log k. But I think that uh, I, so I did something, did I do something wrong in the parameters? Uh, I think above it's k squared. Above it's k, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, it's k squared here? Yes, right. Okay. okay. Here, there's going to be a log. No, I'm sorry. That's better. So I'm going to have to take products of roughly that number of elements to reach any element in the group. Um, and so when I check the relations, the amount by which they're satisfied will degrade. Instead of being epsilon, it'll be epsilon times uh, that much. Uh, so the theorem that I would get by applying that proof strategy is the same theorem as here, but here there would be a polynomial dependence in K instead of a polynomial dependence in K. Um, in order to prove this theorem, uh, you have to do something slightly non-trivial, which is you are going to extend uh, approximate homomorphisms from that very small set to the entire group, uh, but you can't afford to lose, uh, you know, to use just the triangle inequality to control your errors. You need to do something much more subtle. Uh, which is the special ingredient in the, in, the, in the proof of this, which is the thing that I haven't seen in this, in this context. So I wanted to mention that. Um, is, it, you, is it a random proof? I mean, sorry? You, you choose the, is it the randomizer? No, so I'm going to, that's what you're going to give I'll use the last six minutes uh, to the construction. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll use seven minutes. Okay, so I'll forget you. Okay, so uh, let's do it here. Okay, but in just one word, we're going to um, get these presentations using error correcting codes. Um, in fact, I could use a randomized construction, but I will, I will. Well, no, for that, I don't know how to achieve this using a randomized construction. Sorry. Um, so we're going to uh, construct these presentations using error correcting codes. So I'll just give you a definition. So, a definition uh, A, N, K. So these are not the same N, K, and D. Before, but they're the standard N, K, and D in our collection. So N, K, D, uh, binary linear code. Uh, this is just a subspace. So it's uh, C, and this C is a subspace of F2 to the N, such that the dimension of C is K. And uh, the subspace has the very special property that all non-zero um, uh, elements in it have very large uh, uh, humming weights. So for every x non-zero in C, the humming weight of x is bigger than uh, d. So the humming weight is the number of non-zero entries. So if two has zero and one, so it's the number of ones. So uh, ideally, um, n is something, k is like, um, Close to n, like n by 10 or something, you want, or even 0.99n, you want a very large subspace, and you want the dimension to be also linear. So let me tell you how, uh, whenever you have an error correcting code, you can construct a presentation of z2 to the k from it, and this is how we're going to obtain that presentation. <laughs> so this is just an observation z2 to the k. I can always write it, okay, I can write it in the ways that I wrote there, but here's one more way. I can take now n generators. So I fix such a code, and then I take n generators, and I require these generators to be uh, idempotent. I require them to commute. So these are the same relations I had before. If I stop here, I have z to uh, n, uh, but I'm going to impose uh, linear relations that define this subspace. Okay, so I'll write, um, and I forgot to introduce this. So So these are linear relations on the x i's. These h, they're just zero one values that specify what the linear relation is. And these linear relations are linear relations that define the subspace. So you can always write c as the kernel of some matrix h, where h is the matrix in 
of the n such that the dimension of the current is k. Okay, it's called the parity check, which was in that direction. Uh, but you know, these are just the linear relations that specify equal. So that's it. So for those of you who know a little bit of uh, coding, um, the, the presentation here at the top, the, the very large one, it's obtained by this construction, but using as code uh, the, the Hadamard code, um, uh, which is a very long uh, code. Um, um, okay, so um, uh, the code that's used to obtain that is a, is a, is, is, is a very good code, but it's, it's hard to say exactly why you need that specific code. So it's, it's a real Muller code. <laughs> Uh, so read Muller codes are defined as evaluation tables of polynomials. So I don't have time to go into too much um, uh, error correcting codes. So if you don't know about this, it's it's okay. It's a code that's right. Sorry. You say it's something special about it. It's not just the good rate and good dimension. It's what you need more. It's not clear. So um, uh, an open question I can state to end this particular lecture. Um, I mean, I'm stating it a second early, but um, is is I identify uh, if there's a relationship between uh, some parameter of a, of a code, uh, just a classical error correcting code. And um, you can always construct this presentation and you can ask, okay, what's the modulus of stability? You can always ask the question. Uh, is that a function only of the parameters of the code? And is the function, of the, for all I know, it, it's, it's, it's not. I don't know how to do it. It's definitely not a function only of the distance. Um, it's going to involve some other things. Yeah, you would expect maybe something like local testability to enter the game here. Right, that's true. So, so actually, that's. The point that's a little bit beyond where we got, but um, you can restrict the notion of stability to only epsilon homomorphisms in two specific dimensions. Uh, okay, you just restrict the class of objects you consider. In particular, this, since these are abelian groups, you can even ask about the question about approximate homomorphisms in two dimension one. Um, it turns out that stability with respect to that notion of homomorphism is already non trivial. Um, but that is known to be equivalent to a particular property of codes that's uh, called local testability. Um, so, okay. Uh, now that we look at higher dimensions, you could call it like higher dimensional or non commutative local testability. I, I don't know. You know. Maybe it needs its own name, or maybe you can reduce it to something else. We, we don't know. Um, uh, let me not write anything more on the board. I'll, I'll just say it now. So if you take a read Muller code, so read Muller codes are defined over large fields. So you need to consider a binary version of the read Muller code, but these are technicalities. Uh, you obtain this presentation, and you can show the and you can and you can show the stability result. Um, and this is not so easy. I mean, it takes like a lot of pages of linear algebra to show. So, if there was also a simpler proof of that statement, I, I would find that interesting. Um, okay, but I'll, I'll uh, stop right on time. That's, I'm impressed with myself. So, um, uh, but there's time for questions. So maybe maybe just to. Uh, Sum up. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I hope that uh, this was an interesting journey. So we, you know, started from the problems in, in operator algebras and connected them to questions in. Uh, um, this is a repeating Barkov's introduction in a way in uh, in, in quantum information. Philipson's problem, uh, and, uh, and and these questions were very easily reformulated as showing that uh, very specific convex sets are, um, are are distinct. And our strategy for showing this distinction was to uh, show computability. Of our optimization of linear functionals over, over one of the sets, um, and so far they were they were just uh, like sort of math uh, language. Um, but then, in order to construct these linear functions uh, that are that are hard to optimize, this is where the, the computer science arguments uh, came in. So uh, we, we 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 found that uh, the theory of non-local games gave us a way to construct linear functions, and by thinking of non-local games as interactive proofs, and this is where the fine-grained complexity. Uh, uh, comes in, we think of them as verifying statements, we're able to uh, perform manipulations on them, and that's this compression, which is kind of a version of delegated computation. Um, and in the end, implemented, implementing compression, the most non-trivial steps of it are there's two. One is the PT, PCP theorem, which I didn't go over, uh, and the other is, 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 uh, is this part here, uh, which is the part that's really uh, the quantum part in that sense. Okay, so... Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, are there further questions? So you use Reed Mueller, is that what it's called? Reed Mueller. Yes, so uh, in that and then in the Heisenberg group, what do you use? Ah, uh, so there there is not so there is a general way um, to take um, one or two, they don't need to be the same presentations of C2 to the K efficient and construct one for the body group. Um, basically, you just take um, Let's say you had uh, this one, you double it. So you take these n generators, then you take n other like z's, z1 up to zn, 
Uh, you put the same constraints there on the Zs, um, and then you add some anti-commutation relations between X and Z generators whenever appropriate. So you have to figure out exactly what's the anti-commutation relation that you need to put, but, but that's it. And it's got a good parameter. Uh, yes, so there's a, there's a, actually Miguel did this to LaSalle, so there's a, a, a general result that say that if you take um, a, a, a stable presentation of Z2 to the K in that sense, and then you construct the candidate stable presentation for the polygroup the way I just described, you copy it twice and you put anti-commutation, um, as, 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 as long as there's a, um, uh, so in fact, in this case, for, for that step, the distance of the code is relevant. So as long as you started from a code that has a linear distance, uh, you'll get the same stability for the polygon. Yeah. So where does the representation come in at that? Say that again? You said something about the irreducible representation. The big one. The big one. Oh, the polygon. Where do they come in? Yeah. Um, uh, ah, I didn't explain how, uh, sorry. I didn't explain how this part of the lecture connects to the previous part. So in the previous part, we were trying to design a game HN um, that uh, has a requirement such that when you succeed in the game with probability one, then the strategy that you use has this particular structure and in particular, it has high dimensions. Okay, so how is that gonna be constructed? Are uh, we gonna start from this theorem and then we're gonna design a game uh, that are questions that are kind of labeled by generators um, and uh, whatever constraints we put in the game are going to force whatever measurements the players use for those questions to satisfy the relations. So we're going to think of the strategy as a function from the generators to unitaries. I mean, I define strategies using projections, but you can construct unitaries from them. And the game is going to be designed such that um, any successful strategy, the unitaries you derive from it must satisfy the relations. Then you apply the stability result to say, oh, well, then this strategy must be close to uh, 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 homomorphism. And then you study homomorphisms of the polygon. And then you realize that most of them are trivial and you can rule them out by other arguments. And there's only one that's not trivial and has dimension to the n. And this is what gives you the consequence. Mm -hmm. Just to say one more thing the way these relations are checked, we saw now that the relations are all pretty simple relations commutation and anti commutation. And if you remember from last time, the magic square game. We saw how a game could force anti-commutation relation between operators associated with the strategy. And so um, that, that's used here. And going from this to the first part. Like it's not on time after all. <laughs> well, it's really directly related to your main topic, but what did uh, Gavros and Khatami do with their definition? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, they proved a stronger result than what I just uh, no, actually, no, they did prove that result. There's even a follow-up work by uh, Tom, the chief, maybe Ozawa, that extends this to amenable groups, so as long as you can average stuff. Um, I don't know, maybe Miguel, Mihail, do you know? Well, I don't really know what motivated them uh, in the end. Ah, that's a good question. And what are the consequences? As far as I know, it wasn't a particularly impactful Result, uh, until it got picked up by like, you know, this kind of work and other works in non-local game. I, I don't know. Are there any questions for Zoom? Yeah, there, there you said that there was some, some particular set of questions that involved a number 10 to the 12. <laughs> Where did the number come from? So it's not here yet. So it's, uh, it's um, um, okay, so this is not even a game. This is a presentation. Um, from this presentation, we create a game, the game HN that I described before, but that you know has an integer N and there's no 10 to the 12 there. Um, the game HN is used to implement compression, which is just a map from games to games. Um, the ultimate game, the one that's used finally um, is, uh, sort of a fixed point uh, of this compression procedure. Um, um, but uh, you need to go into a little bit into how you uh, uh, the, the train machine M, which is what you really want to start from, how that is embedded into the game. Um, and it, it, it turns out that the, the definition of the game or the definition of the fixed point, uh, it involves like a lot of the things that are here on the board, but these are not 10 to the 12 kind of size things. I said 10 to the 12 because at one step, um, which uh, we need to use um, the definition of the game involves um, running a refutation procedure. Uh, maybe this is a bit too complicated. Maybe we should take this over lunch. So it, uh, 
Um, in, yeah, it comes from things I haven't talked about uh, that are I don't think of as being so important. But uh, uh, in, in in the game, uh, before generating even questions, uh, the verifier looks at the Turing machine and does a bunch of checks. Uh, and these checks are are all finite, um, but 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 they're a little bit uh, involved. And this the ten to the twelve kind of comes from this rather than. All right, if there are no more questions, uh, let's have a big round of applause.